Hi, I'm Martin Sweatman, and in this video I'll continue my review of the Younger Dryas impact debate research. Now, so far we've covered the published research from the original Firestone et al. paper in 2007 through to the end of 2018 using the new bibliography at the Cosmic Tusk website. In this video, I'll cover most of 2019 from Dominguez et al. through to Moore et al. As you can see from the green color of these records, uh, all these papers are supportive. Now I've already reviewed this paper by Napier on my blog, and you can find the link here. So this is his paper, The Hazard from Fragmenting Comets. Essentially it develops a more detailed argument for the likely impact risk posed by a giant 100 kilometer comet uh, trapped in an Earth crossing orbit as it decays within the inner solar system. And it supports what I wrote in chapter 6 of my book uh, Prehistory Decoded, which you can also read for free on my blog. Now the paper by Dietrich et al, uh, like the paper by Birchard from 2017, uh, which pointed the finger at the Saginaw Bay area, investigates the possibility that certain geological features might have resulted from unusual kinds of cosmic impacts. Now in this particular case, they look at a roughly circular feature in Greece known as the Pagasitic Gulf. But like Birchard's work, this is mostly geological and outside my comfort zone, so I'll not actually review that paper either. Now the paper by Dominguez et al. really has very little to say about the impact theory, as that's not the focus of the paper. So, so that leaves us with these three papers by Pino et al., Thackeray et al., and Moore et al., which are all considered to very strongly support the impact theory. So let's begin with the paper by Pino et al. Now this is an important paper because it extends the Younger Dryas black mat down to the southern end of the Americas. Here we are in Orsono City, uh, which is at the, the southern end of Chile. And specifically we're at the, the Pilaucao site uh, in Orsono City. So you can see the archaeological trenches in this suburb of the city next to this house. I wonder what the people think who, who are living here. Anyway, this is a nice paper because they've got a lot of evidence. So this is a view of one of the trenches. And it seems that the Young Dryas boundary is right here at the contact between these two uh, sedimentary layers. So this is just a schematic drawing of the photo above of one of the trenches. Uh, and on the left here we've got a height measurement relative to some arbitrary fixed point called a datum. And on the right is the age of the sediment according to an age depth model for this trench. Now the Younger Dryas boundary is between these two layers called PB8 and PB7. Now actually these labels are wrong. They should be PB9 and PB8. So this is just a typo, nothing to worry about, but it confused me to begin with. Now this boundary layer is not completely flat, so we need to be careful with stating heights for the boundary layer at different locations. Now further on in the paper is the age depth model for a different trench which is very close to the ones I've just shown. And in this trench, the boundary between PB8 and PB9 is almost exactly at 550 centimeters relative to the datum. Now this blue band is the age depth model, along with its uncertainty ranges at one and two sigma or 67 and 95%. And it's nice to see this data drawn this way. It makes it easy to see that the Nine, the uh, PB8, PB9 boundary is perfectly consistent with the estimated age of the Younger Dryas event given by these vertical dashed red lines. 
So what do these guys find at the Younger Dryas boundary here? Well, they find everything you'd expect to see for a Younger Dryas black mat. So they find impact spherules. So these are microscopic silica and iron rich spherules with a dendritic surface pattern indicating quenching from a high temperature. And they're found only at the Younger Dryas boundary within the range uh, that they examine. They also find some chromium rich spherules too, which they say are likely to result from the impact with a local basalt, uh, but they rule out volcanism for the origin of those spherules because of the high iron content. And they also find a strong platinum spike right at the boundary too, and a peak in charcoal, along with sudden changes in uh, pollen and the abundance of uh, seeds and so forth, indicating a dramatic change in the environment. So it seems this boundary between PB8 and PB9 is clearly the Younger Dryas boundary. Now very interestingly they find plentiful signs of megafauna below this boundary but not above as this plot shows really nicely. So this is a section across the trench with this line representing the location of the Younger Dryas boundary and these dotted lines beneath well they're like contours that show uh, how the sediment ages ages with depth so each dashed line is is uh, 50 years older than the one above now the circles or the symbols here represent the location of megafaunal bones including things like horses and sloths and, and it seems that what they show is that the megafaunal decline began around 50 to 100 years before the Younger Dryas event signalled by the boundary. See how the bones are clustered well below the actual boundary layer. They don't go right up to it. Now that seems a bit odd. Why would the number of megafaunal bones at this site suddenly decline uh, several decades before the Younger Dryas event? Well, the authors also plot the abundance of a specific type of fungal spore that are associated with the presence of megafauna in this plot here at the side. Uh, so these fungal spores are found in um, the megafaunal dung. Uh, and very interesting, the, interestingly, these spores show quite a different story. You see, the abundance of these spores varies quite a lot before the event, but then it seems to increase quite markedly in the final 50 to 100 years before the Younger Dryas event, before dropping off practically to zero, very suddenly uh, right after the event. Now at first sight this appears to contradict the evidence from the megafaunal bones, as it seems to suggest there were more megafauna in the final 50 to 100 years before this event, not fewer. So how can we explain this? Well actually the authors come up with a really nice explanation. They point out that the bones indicate megafauna dying, not megafauna living. The spores show that after the megafauna stopped dying their numbers increased. So perhaps this site was a particular hunting location. Perhaps the megafauna were hunted here until around 50 to 100 years before the Younger Dryas event leaving lots of their bones, but then perhaps the hunters, probably human, moved on to other hunting sites. And this meant the megafaunal population at this site increased, increasing the concentration of dung and spores, while the number of bones decreased. But then the Younger Dryas event effectively wiped them out within a generation. Now it's important to note we don't expect in this case that a change in climate caused the dramatic end of the South American megafauna and that's because the Younger Dry Dryas climate change typically had an opposite trend in the southern hemisphere. So instead of a dramatic decrease in average temperature after the onset of the Younger Dryas event we see which is what we see in the northern hemisphere in the southern hemisphere we tend to see an opposite trend. So the southern hemisphere experiences a gradual warming in climate indicated by these 
red arrows. At least that's what these plots show. So, so these are temperature reconstructions from Antarctic ice cores. Uh, and so these green upper lines here are atmospheric methane concentrations, which uh, clearly show the sort of relative location of the, the Younger Dryas period. Now this opposite behaviour at high southern latitudes is thought to be because of the way that massive ocean currents switch their routes at the onset of the Younger Dryas period. So basically the warm southern ocean waters were blocked, it's thought, from travelling north, thus keeping the southern oceans warm, in fact gradually warming, while the northern oceans cooled. And it makes a lot of sense, certainly it aligns with all the evidence I've seen so far, which is that the American megafauna were likely decimated by this event and overhunting or climate change by themselves can't explain the evidence. All right, so let's move on to our next paper. So now we move from South America to South Africa. Now this is quite remarkable. In the space of just two papers, we've suddenly opened up the Western part of the Southern Hemisphere, massively uh, expanding uh, the domain for the Younger Dryas black mat. So what evidence do Thackeray and colleagues have for the Younger Dryas impact in South Africa? Well, essentially they report on the discovery of a platinum abundance found in the sediment at an archaeological site known as Wonder Crater. Now the first thing to note is that Wonder Crater has got nothing to do with the impact. In fact, it's not even an impact crater. It's just the name of a small region in South Africa near a spring on an ancient floodplain. Now here is their main data. A sediment core drilled at the site has an associated age depth model, and that was generated uh, in earlier work. And at exactly the date expected for the Younger Dryas event, they find a massive abundance of platinum. Now there are a couple of things to note here. First, the amount of platinum is huge. So until now we've been dealing with platinum at the Younger Dryas boundary in units of parts per billion, but here it's in effectively in parts per million. So the concentration of platinum in this sample is about a thousand times greater than we've seen elsewhere. But the dating of this sediment is much less certain. As you can see, at the level of 95% confidence, or 2 sigma, the uncertainty in, these, in the date of this sediment is about a thousand years. However, in earlier work, um, they looked at uh, seeds and pollen in the sediment, uh, and they were used to build up a temperature timeline. Uh, and from this, we can see that the platinum spike occurs right at the top of this temperature spike. In other words, directly after this uh, platinum, the temperature in the region plummets by around about a thousand years. So this looks like the onset of the Younger Dryas, which seems to have caused a sudden cooling effect in this region, just like in the Northern Hemisphere, and unlike at Palauco in Chile, as we saw in the earlier paper. So it does seem likely that this is the Younger Dryas platinum spike. Now one more thing, uh, volcanism is unknown at this time in this region of South Africa, indicating this platinum is probably resulting from a cosmic impact, yet more evidence in favour of the Younger Dryas impact. So let's move on to our final paper. So this time the evidence is from an ancient lake or pond known as White Pond in South Carolina. Uh, now the title of this paper says it all. At the exact time expected we have another site where we find platinum, soot, and a decline in fungal spores indicating a decline in megafauna. Uh, but let's have a look at the evidence. So here it is. Th this is the age depth model from this sediment core. Actually a couple of radiocarbon measurements are taken from a different core which is carefully lined up against this one, uh, but that's okay. The vertical dashed red lines show the expected age range for the Younger Dryas impact. And at this same time we see within the sediment core first uh, a layer of soot and then slightly above it 
a layer of platinum. In fact, it seems this section of the sediment, about uh, 10 to 15 centimeters deep, was laid down very quickly and corresponds perhaps to just a few decades. And we've seen this at other sites. It's becoming clear that we can't simply make an age depth model linear across the Younger Dryas boundary because the rate of sedimentation during these few decades seemed to have been much higher. So presumably it was very stormy during this time. And remember the evidence from the Greenland GISP-2 ice core, uh, which is that the platinum somehow was lofted into the atmosphere and it took up to about 20 years to settle out. So it makes sense that the platinum, uh, the peak in the platinum abundance occurs slightly above the soot, which likely settled out in a matter of weeks. Okay, so far, so good. Everything agrees perfectly with the Younger Dryas impact scenario. And then apparently uh, above the platinum abundance there is a, a minimum in the fungal spores followed by a gap in the timeline, this uh, so-called hiatus, which at this site lasts over 2,000 years. So presumably during this time the environmental conditions changed so much uh, that the sediment stopped accumulating in the pond, so perhaps there was a drought here. Now in more detail, here is the platinum peak at the onset of the Younger Dryas. Uh, but then there seems, after this hiatus of a few thousand years, there seems to be another peak in platinum uh, about a thousand years after the end of the Younger Dryas period. Maybe that's another impact or perhaps a volcano. Uh, but considering that the platinum to palladium ratio given by this blue line remains fairly constant, perhaps it's more likely to represent a volcano. But what about the fungal spores which accumulate in the megafaunal animal dung? So let's take a close look at that data. That's this brown uh, curve here. Well, it seems to me that at this location, the megafauna were not so much affected. Um, there might have been an initial decline, just about here, followed by a small rebound. But because we're missing over 2,000 years or so of sediment, we don't know what happened next. Essentially, we can't use this data to say much about the megafauna. Certainly, it doesn't look like they were wiped out in an instant at this location, but we don't know the longer term effect. What we can say is that after several thousand years, the megafaunal population at this location had recovered somewhat, uh, but then it almost disappears. Okay, and that's that for, for this paper. So what do we have from 2019? Well, first we see that the Younger Dryas boundaries extended to the southern end of South America, which is quite remarkable. And we also see a strong platinum signal from South Africa, which given the absence of volcanism in this region <coughs> at the time, is indicating the platinum dust lofted into the atmosphere by the impact reached all around the globe, which is what you'd expect given that it was circulating in the atmosphere for nearly 20 years. And we see yet more data from North America. It all agrees with the impact theory. And so far, all the evidence we've seen appears to support a significant and sudden effect on megafaunal populations. Well, we've nearly finished our review now. We've just got papers published this year in 2020 left to review, uh, and we'll complete those in the next video. If you like that, then take a look at my book and blog and other videos on my channel here.